know if you're like me, but I had always wondered why there was a fall, why there's a Satan, what happened. I had heard that there is a war, or some people call it a great controversy, between Satan and God, and somehow Earth is stuck in the middle, but I didn't understand what it meant. God is love, why is there a fall? What is it that happened? If the universe is out there, why didn't Satan go to some other planet and populate that planet with all of his angels? Why is Earth so much at the center of it? We're gonna start with Bible Study 2, and this is gonna be the first of a two-part series. So it's Bible Study 2A, and we're gonna look at who was Satan, and if God is love, why the fall, what happened? And so this is entitled Origin of the Great Controversy, and we're going to start in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So here we have this war in heaven. Now we know that heaven is supposed to be a place of peace, and here we have war. And to further understand this, if we look at the Greek, for that word, we see the word polymos, and it means battle, quarrel, strife, a war of thoughts, ideas, or belief systems. So this place of peace where there was one way of doing things, now there's this war with ideas, and there's this war between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels. And then verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So here we see that Satan in heaven was deceiving people, and now we see here on the earth the same agenda is happening. He sets out to deceive the whole world. And even if we look at the meaning of the word Satan, in the Greek, that's four, five, six, seven. It means adversary, one who opposes another in purpose or act, the accuser. And then the word devil, which is in the Greek, the number one, two, two, eight. He's a false accuser, a slanderer. So we here we have this being that's now on earth. So now let's further look into this at Ezekiel 28, verse one. The word of the Lord came again unto me saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. So here we see God taking up a lamentation, and he uses the prince of Tyrus, an earthly ruler, to symbolize Lucifer. There are going to be things said about this earthly prince that could not be said about an earthly prince. So now we're going to go down to verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation unto the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So sealest up the sum, we see that there's this seal of perfection, the sum of everything exalted is in Lucifer. And he's full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamonds, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, the gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So here we see that this being was in Eden, the garden of God. So this, again, we can see now, we're no longer talking about the earthly king. The ruler behind Tyrus, we can see, is, is Satan or Lucifer. So here we see that Lucifer was in the garden of God and that we see the mention of tabrets and pipes. So there was music, it was connected to worship, and all these things were found in Satan in the day that was created. So all of beauty and music and worship, everything perfect, wisdom, everything was in him in the day that he was created. He had the seal of perfection. So now verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. We are going to figure out what that means. So we're going to go over to Psalm 99, verse 1. The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He, the Lord, sitteth between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. So that phrase, between the cherubims, we can also look in Psalm 81. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. 
Thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. So now we're going to further look at this dwelling between the cherubim. To do that, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 and 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof. Even so shall you make it. So now we have the sanctuary on earth and it's made after a pattern. So let's look further into that in Hebrews 8 verses 1 through 2 and 5. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So here we have a high priest in the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So this is saying there's a true tabernacle in heaven. The Lord pitched. It wasn't the one under Moses' command. This is the one that the Lord pitched. In heaven so we also see this picture of a tabernacle in heaven in Psalm 102 verse 19 for he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven did the Lord behold the earth so here again we see there's this sanctuary in heaven so now let's go back to Hebrews chapter 8 so we have this true tabernacle that the Lord pitched where God is watching from that area he can see all from that area who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see saith he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount so what's on earth is a shadow or a pattern of what's in heaven so what we see on earth is made to look like what is in heaven so here are some representations of that so in heaven there's the heavenly ministry copied on earth to look like what's happening in heaven and here if we look at the sanctuary on earth it's after a pattern it was very specifically laid out where each item should be and what should happen at each station and when it should happen so now let's go back to Exodus 25 verses 18 to 22 to look what that sanctuary looks like. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high covering the mercy seat with their wings and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be so their wings are covering and protecting the mercy seat and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that i shall give thee and there i will meet with thee and i will commune with thee from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So here we see in the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary or tabernacle, in this place called the most holy place is the Ark of the Testimony. And on top of it is the mercy seat. There are two cherubim on either side. There's one on each side. And then he says he's going to dwell in the middle of it. So these cherubim are protecting something, they're covering something, and we're going to look into that further to see what they're covering. So we're going to go to Exodus 31, verse 18. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. So we can see that those two cherubim were there to protect, to represent, to reveal God's government, and we know that that was one of Lucifer's jobs to protect. He and Ezekiel 28 14, we saw that he was the anointed cherub that covers. He was the highest angel in heaven at the throne of God, the most holy place, he and one other angel. So now let's go to Exodus 34 28 to 29, just to confirm these two tables of testimony, what they are. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't either eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So here we see again in the tabernacle, in the sanctuary, which is the pattern of things that are in heaven, we see that there is in this most holy place this Ark of the Covenant, Ark of the Testimony, and inside 
are two tablets of stone which contain the Ten Commandments. So this was something that God was covering, protecting, and Satan was one of these covering angels whose job was to protect it. So now, Ezekiel 28 verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. So we know he was an anointed cherub that covereth, and we now know what he covered, the Ten Commandments, the mercy seat. And he was on this holy mountain of God. So we can see in these verses that the, the holy mountain of God is a holy kingdom of God. And you can pause it to read all of them. We have Jeremiah 51, 25, Isaiah 66, 20, Psalm 2, verse 6, and Psalm 48, verse 1, to show that a mountain is a kingdom. So let's remember that Lucifer was created perfect, but he had free will. It says in here, God has set him so. He set him with all perfection. He set him up as anointed cherub that covers. And here we see that he had free will. God has never wanted robots, so that is an important thing that we're seeing here. So now let's look at this further. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. So now let's go over to Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So here we can see, how do we enter heaven? By doing the will of the Father. We also see this phrase, work iniquity. Here we see people that are prophesying. They're casting out devils. They've done many wonderful works. And yet Christ still refers to them as people that work iniquity. So this means they aren't doing the will of the Father. So now we need to look more and understand what is the will of the Father? What is God's will? So let's go to Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. So God's will is the law. And we have to choose if we're going to delight in or we're going to rebel against the law. So God is going to put that law within our hearts. It's no longer just going to be on stone. He says he's going to write it on our hearts. And we can see that further in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3, Ezekiel 11, verse 19, Ezekiel 36, verse 26, Jeremiah 31, verse 33, and Hebrews 8, verse 10. So next, we're going to go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Whoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law, known as lawlessness or iniquity. So now let's go back to Ezekiel 28, verse 15, and we're going to go to our second reading of that. So again we read, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. So Satan's heart had turned away from delighting in God's law, and now we have this iniquity, we have this sin that's found in Satan. And we do want to remember that Lucifer was created perfect. He had the sum of everything wonderful in him. And now there's this war over the law of God. He had been the most exalted angel on the mercy seat, beholding God, and he's made a choice now that he doesn't need God's law. So now let's turn to Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? So when we look at the word Lucifer, it means light bearer, morning star. Lucifer was in the most holy place. He bore the light of God to the angels, but he began to entertain ideas. He wants glory unto himself. So this is our own battle in our fallen nature. And it's the same as what the Antichrist does. It wants to take glory to itself instead of giving it to God. Now verse 13, for thou hast said in thine heart, so here we see it's a heart issue, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So when it says I will sit, it's a symbol of rulership and control, and here we have the sides of the north. So if we look at Psalm 48 verse 2, it's a little clue to what that is. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, 
the city of the great king. So the size of the north is connected to the city of the great king, Mount Zion. And then verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So in this, we see five points of ascension. We see I will ascend, I will exalt, I will sit, I will ascend, I will be like the most high. So now we're going to go over to Ezekiel 28 verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So here we see there's a multitude of thy merchandise and in the New King James Version, it says abundance of thy trading. So Satan is possessing something and then he's selling it. So now verse 17, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. So here we see because of, by reason of, thy beauty, thy brightness. So there's this self-love that's happening, which leads to a choice, a decision being made. And we know in God's government, it's one of self-sacrifice. So Satan is now rebelling against that. So we know he had been perfect. And now all of his wisdom, everything has become corrupted. And now he's made a decision. So now we're going to go over to Galatians 5.14 to look into more about this government of God, what it's all about. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So this is that law that Satan is rebelling against. And it's to love thy neighbor as thyself. And we can look at this further in Romans 13, verse 8 through 10. So you're probably going to recognize something in this very quickly. Let's take a look at it. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So here, if you look at it, in the Ten Commandments, we have four that deal with our relationship with God, and we have six that deal with our relationship with our neighbor. And so if we love in this way, we're fulfilling God's law. And remember that Lucifer was dwelling in the middle, in the center of God's love. He was right there at the mercy seat of God, gazing on all of that. And he was Lucifer, the light bearer. So he was the one bringing that light to the others. That was his job to bring the light, to bear the light. And he began to reject that and traffic in these ideas that God isn't these things. So let's go back to Ezekiel 28, 18 to see this laid out more clearly, this trafficking of ideas. 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. So here again we're seeing this iniquity of thy traffic, the multitude of thy merchandise. So there are things that are being sold. And then we also see in this that his heart was lifted up. And then secondly, it defiled the sanctuary. And remember, this sanctuary is in heaven, and it's become defiled. So when his heart was lifted up, his heart had moved away from the law, which then led to lawlessness. Remember, we have the Ten Commandments, God's government, in the middle of that ark, and he's rebelling against that. And in verse 17, one last thing we want to see before we end the study is that it says, I will lay thee before kings. So I don't have a neat copy of this, but I just want to review what we've learned so far about Satan or Lucifer. We know that Lucifer was created perfect. He was a seal and sum of perfection. We saw that in Ezekiel 28, 12, everything that could be put in him was put in him. Lucifer was the anointed cherub that covers in the most holy place at God's throne. He was the light bearer. He bore the light of God to the angels. We found that out in Isaiah 14, 12. He dwelled in the center of God's love. Lucifer's heart became lifted up. And because of that, his wisdom became corrupted. 
He had the self-love that he was enveloped in. That was Ezekiel 29, 2. And Lucifer began to entertain ideas and to traffic these ideas. That's Ezekiel 28, 16, verse 18. And then Revelation 12, 7, we saw that war broke out in heaven because of these ideas that were getting trafficked. We had God's government, which is self-sacrifice, and Satan's government, which is self-exaltation. And this, again, is the same as what happens with the Antichrist system. It wants to take glory to itself. And this is our own battle in our fallen nature to decide if we're going to go towards God's government or Satan's government. Lucifer will tell you that you should have free will, but God is a dictator. So the issue is over iniquity. We have this lawlessness that's happening where there's no love. Christ said that the perfect summing of the law is to love your neighbor as yourself and to love God. So it's all about love, but Satan is rebelling against that. And we know that God, being the creator, could have destroyed them all. But God has a desire for all to have an understanding of the two ways and to make a choice. So you can either choose self-love, self-exaltation, or self-sacrifice. He wants us to have a full understanding of whether Lucifer is wrong or not so that we can serve him, not out of fear, but out of love. So here we have in Revelation 12, verses 8 and 9, we see that Lucifer is cast to the earth with his angels. But God does have a plan, and so we're going to look at that in the solution to the great controversy. So we have Lucifer's ideal, which is no law, do what thou wilt. And then we have God's ideal, which is the law of love. And so Lucifer versus God, this is the great controversy. It's a controversy over God's throne over God's honor, over God's right to rule. So next study, we'll take a look further into this and what is the solution to this great controversy that's happening.